The M54 engine is finally coming together. This is the final video of the series. If you guys didn't know, I'm building Chris Fix's engine for his E46 and his race team who are racing that car in the Lemons endurance race. And they need a backup engine. In case that engine fails, they need something to replace it with. And that's what this is here. So we're gonna go ahead and get this thing finally assembled. If you guys didn't see in the last episode, we took the engine, the cylinder head to a machine shop. We then brought it back here, did all the measurements and specs. We got the bottom end assembly done. So now we're gonna continue on and we're gonna get this thing finally wrapped up. So let's go. All right, guys, we're gonna be upgrading the engine oil pump. Right now it's in actually really good working condition. However, the, it is a really common failure point. And when the guys are out on the racetrack, this is the last thing you want to fail. So the, a few ways that it does fail, uh, this is the original setup right here. It uses this really thin nut. It is left-hand thread, so it's a lefty, tighty, righty, loosey. Anyway, this nut will start to back off while it's running. And then what will happen is this gear will slide forward, push the nut completely off. And then now you have the gear spinning on the shaft. However, it's not driving the pump. And if the pump's not driving, you lose oil pressure, you can say goodbye to your engine. Another way is the factory gear has these splines and the splines fit onto the shaft. Well, those splines will shear off. And then so again, you'll start to get where this thing starts spinning and not driving the pump. The last way it fails, there's a narrow part of the shaft that is not as thick as the rest of it and it will shear off just completely. Again, not driving the pump and it's really bad. So we're using an Achilles and I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that right, Achilles uh, upgrade kit and it addresses all of these problems. If you take a quick look at the two gears, the Achilles has like this squared gear and the shaft is much larger, a lot more material instead of all these little splines. And this thing is press fit. So if I were to put this on, it doesn't go on completely. It's got a slight taper to it. So once you put the bolt in, it press fits on there. There's very, very slim chance, if any, that this thing is gonna back off or it's going to shear. Another thing is this bolt cannot back off because they give you this wire and the wire goes through this little hole in the bolt, on the end of the bolt, and it wire ties to the gear itself. So that way this physically can't back off because the wire is holding it. And I believe that the material that they use is like a hardened steel or something. I'm not gonna claim that officially. I don't know that for sure. But anyway, we have to rebuild the pump and install this. So we're gonna do that now. First thing we're gonna do is pull off the front of the pump and the housing. I removed the five bolts with a 10 millimeter socket to release the front cover. Then it's just a simple as sliding out the drive gear and the ring gear. Okay, so what we have to do is the rotor is on is pressed onto the shaft and we have to press the rotor off of the shaft. So we're gonna go over the press, we're gonna knock that off. But before we do that, we gotta measure how far that is. So we're going to take our dial caliper here, gonna open it up. Okay, we are going to measure the end of the rotor and the end of this flat spot of the shaft. Okay, I'm gonna lock that down. And the reason is because when we install this rotor onto the shaft, it has to be the same uh, distance. So let's go ahead and get that done right now. No special tools needed here. I just use a 3 8 extension to drive the shaft out of the gear. I swap it out with a new shaft and I use painter's tape as an easy way to see my stopping point. This ensures the length of the new shaft protruding from the drive gear matches exactly as before with the original shaft. So on the front of this uh, gear is a little dimple. There's also a little dimple on here. And what that does indicates that that is the outside portion of the gear. So that faces the front. So they are directional, apparently. All right, get that all lubricated. Shove that in there. We're gonna turn it until the shaft finds the hole. There it goes. And this should be perfectly flush. And it is, looks really good. This is a machined surface and there is no gasket. Gonna snug these up to about 10 newton meters. I've done this enough times I can feel 10 newton meters. It's not a critical torque, just as long as it's not loose or over tightened. And that feels pretty good. The oil pump gets installed towards the front of the engine right here. This is the windage tray. Basically its job is to help calm down the splashing and aeration of oil the crankshaft would create by rotating into the oil supply. The tray is a barrier between the crankshaft and the supply of oil that's in the oil pan. Okay, these are at 23 newton meters. Come on, there we go. Ok, 
Okay, just go through and verify these one more time and I'll mark them. All right, this is our pickup tube. So I'm gonna squirt a little bit of oil in here. I can't fill it with oil because if I were to, if I did do that, which is how you normally would do it, as soon as I flipped it upside down to install it, all the oil would come right back out and we'd make a giant mess. Now, if I was installing this in the car, this engine would be right side up. I would fill this thing with oil, we'd put it back in there, the oil would stay in there, we'd bolt it up and it would be primed and ready to go. This, however, I'm building the engine, so it's upside down all the time, you can't do that. When the oil pan is in the car, and they fill it with oil, it'll be completely smudged with oil. So what they're gonna have to do is pull a um, fuse for the fuel pump, they'll crank the engine a few times, and what they're gonna do is prime the oil. They'll loosen the oil filter housing and they'll make sure there's oil in there. And if there is, then we know that the pump is primed and ready. They'll tighten the oil filter, they'll start the engine and make sure that that red oil can light goes off within a few seconds. If it does, then they're good. A little bit of oil on that seal, get that in there. Another way people will prime these, they'll use engine assembly grease or petroleum jelly and they'll put some grease in there. So what it does, it creates an automatic suction. I don't have engine assembly grease. You don't want to use wheel bearing grease or lithium grease because that will ruin the pump and don't want to do that. So I'd rather put it in with just the assembly lube and let them prime it. Okay, we're going to reuse the original sprocket, but I got a new chain. It's made by Iwis. Maybe that's how you pronounce it. It is a racing chain. What makes it a racing chain? I, I, I don't know. It's, it looks identical to the old one, for the except, except that it's new. I don't know. I don't know what makes it a racing chain. I don't know if they use better materials, maybe better rollers. I don't know. But the way I like to do this, get that on there. Now, this is keyed. If you guys remember, there's an F on the front of it, stamped. So I got to make sure that we are lined up here and it's going to be a lot easier to rotate the pump than it is for me to rotate the engine I'm like one tooth off let's try this oh there we go we're almost there almost perfect this new chain is a little tight, so I use a screwdriver as leverage to slip the gear into place, give it a couple tap tap a ruse, and when I tighten the fastener, the gear will be fully seated onto the shaft. Okay, now if you remember, this is left-handed thread. We're gonna use some blue Loctite. I just naturally wanna keep, I just wanna turn it right. It's so unnatural to turn it left to tighten it. Keep, try to keep the engine from rotating here. Here we go, 20, negative 22 <laughs> new meters. All right, we're gonna be installing the safety wire now. This is a left-handed bolt. So that means, like we talked about, I've probably said it three times already in this video, but basically you gotta turn it left to tighten it. So if I wanted to loosen this, I'd have to turn it right. We don't want this bolt turning this direction. So we're gonna put the safety wire in, they give you these little tiny holes, and then we're gonna pull the wire uh, the same direction as if you were to tighten this, which would be left. And then we're gonna tie it off to the sprocket. What you want to do is feed the wire through this little hole here. All right, we're going to pull this through until it's about halfway. Cinch that down. Now we're going to be tying it off between these two holes in the sprocket. Squeeze that down. I'm going to lock the pliers. And then we're going to pull. Actually, I don't like how that looks, so let's give it a little. There we go. That's a much better looking safety wire there. Go ahead and release these. Put a little hook. We're going to swing it on in like that. Let's grab it with our pliers here. Drag that through. A little bit more. That looks pretty good right there. Okay, trim off the end. And we'll roll this sucker in like this. And we're done. Before we put the oil pan on, we need to actually do the timing cover. As you can see, the ceiling surface extends out to the bottom of the timing cover. It also extends out to the bottom of the rear main seal plate. So we gotta make sure we put those on first. The rear main seal is pretty straightforward, but the timing cover, we gotta put on the timing cover, or we gotta put on the timing chain and the timing guides. So let's go ahead and get that done right now. 
I got new timing guides because they are made out of plastic and they do fail. This is the fixed guide. It goes right in here. It snaps into place. Just like that. This one is the one that actually the timing chain tensioner will push on and put tension onto the chain. The timing chain itself, it's the same brand as the oil pump. It's also a racing chain, whatever that means. So this timing cover has two independent gaskets. And to be honest with you, it's a little tricky trying to put them on. So I have a trick for that as well. I'm gonna use zip ties. We're gonna hold these gaskets in place. All right, so these zip ties definitely make life a lot easier. I don't have to worry about fumbling around the gaskets and it's just gonna go right on. If you guys remember from the first episode, I did the um, template for the bolts. I still have that right here because they're all different lengths. So I'll just set that down there as a reference. I'll grab what I need. All right, we'll just get a few of these loosely started and then I can snip off the zip ties. I know this might be a little difficult for you guys to see, but we're gonna try our best here. Uh, this actually has some dowel pins on the back that'll hold our gasket in place, which is pretty nice. Put those right there. Now, before I put the seal on, I like to lubricate the end of the crankshaft, a little bit of oil, just so the seal will slide over a little easier. And the seal comes with this uh, plastic ring or this plastic cup. And actually what it's supposed to do is assist you in the install of the rear main seal. So we're gonna slide it down like this. Line it up. Now what we're, what I'm looking here is to make sure that we don't, that the uh, seal itself doesn't roll over. Okay, it feels like it went on pretty smooth. Give it a quick look. Yeah, it looks really good. It's got the two bigger bolts here. These are 13 head bolts. These get torqued to 22 newton meters. And the smaller ones, which would use a 10 millimeter bolt to tighten those down, get torqued to 10 newton meters. Okay, 10 newton meters. Guys, there's gonna be a lot of times that I use a torque wrench and mark the bolts. I promise you, I'm not gonna show you every single nut and bolt that we tighten down because it's just too much, right? Just know that I did it. All right, we're ready for the oil pan and gasket almost. We're going to seal the joining edges between the timing cover and the end plate of the rear main seal. Because there's a joint cover there, we have to make sure that it doesn't leak out. That's a really compromising position. So we're going to use the sealant. We're just gonna lay a bead across it like this, like this. And we're gonna do the same thing on the other side. And we'll put the gasket on and that will help keep that sealed. Okay, we'll just squish this down right like that. This gasket is made up of metal and rubber. Now it's time for the oil pan, finally. If you guys remember, Chris Fix has an all wheel drive car and there's some differences in the engine because it's all wheel drive. The engine that I got came from a rear wheel drive car. So we had to make some modifications. Some of those were the pickup tube and the oil pan. So the oil pan is for an all wheel drive vehicle. If you guys see here, there's actually an, a hole that goes through it, which is where the axle goes through and the differential bolts up to. So we're updating the pan and the pickup tube along with the dipstick tube to make sure that it's gonna fix this vehicle. It's so much easier doing it on an engine stand than in a car where you're working upside down. This is awesome. All right, we got a brand new oil level sensor. These are kind of common to fail, so we wanna make sure we get a new one of those on. Simple enough, just goes in with three nuts. All right, when it comes to racing, heat is your enemy and you wanna to try to combat it as much as possible. So we actually are installing an EMP water pump. This thing is awesome. It's 20% more flow, so you, get, you can flow the coolant a lot through it a lot faster and, and let the heat dissipate so it doesn't overheat. Uh, it's also got a much larger bearing, so it's more reliable. It'll last a lot longer. I mean, this thing's awesome. Instead of this plastic uh, propeller here that tends to fail over time, this uses a stainless steel impeller. So this thing is awesome. By the way, all the parts that I'm using in this engine, I'll put a link in the description so you guys can decide if you want to get them or not. You can see where I got them from. 
uh, mostly for, mostly all my performance stuff I got from Turner Motorsport and all of the um, replacement parts and gaskets and all the maintenance things I got from FCP Euro. All right guys, it's time to install the oil filter housing. This does a few things. The oil filter cartridge, which is right here, fits inside of here. Right now it's empty. We'll make sure we put this in a little bit later. Uh, this also houses the oil temperature sensor, the oil pressure sensor, and it has this bracket built in, which holds the power steering pump and the belt tensioner. So we're gonna make sure we get that in there. It also holds part of the alternator. So this is a very important piece. Uh, this is a gasket right here that constantly leaks. There's a lot of oil pressure that goes through these two passages and this gasket over time will flatten out and it'll just start spewing out oil. Really common oil leak on these engines. So obviously we got a brand new gasket here. Uh, as you can see, I've cleaned up a lot of these parts here to make them look as new as possible. All right, this has a couple of dowel pins that it lines up on and there's actually three different lengths of bolts used to hold this on. These get torqued to 22 newton meters. Let's just get them, get them all kind of an initial start here and then we'll go and give our final torque. Always lube your seal. You never want to put it in dry. They say to torque this to 25 newton meters. I've done no less than a thousand oil changes on these engines. Never once have I torqued it to 25 newton meters. I just good and tight. Now that we've got the oil filter housing installed, I'm going to put on our belt tensioner. These engines actually have two different styles. There's a spring tensioning one and a hydraulic tensioning one. This one is the hydraulic one. There's a little strut right here. So we're going to go ahead and get this sucker mounted up along with the new pulley. If you guys ever wash the front of your engine, do not use brake cleaner to wash the front of your engine where you have a pulleys. These have a sealed bearing inside of it and brake cleaner will actually get in there and wash it out and then it'll start making all kinds of noises because it washes the grease out of the bearings. It's got a little cap over it, a dust cap to keep it sealed and there we go. Okay, time to install the harmonic balancer. We want to make sure we lubricate the crankshaft and also the uh, seal the crankshaft seal for easy penetration. Now this uh, crankshaft has a keyway on it and so does the harmonic balancer. So we're just gonna make sure we get that lined up. And the reason they do that is for timing, which we'll get into that later after we get the cylinder head on. There we go. It's got a giant washer. We're also gonna lubricate the washer and on both sides. And the reason for that and we're going to lubricate the threads as well for the, uh, the bolts. And the reason is because we're going to torque this thing down to 410 newton meters, which I believe is around 300 foot pounds of torque. And you don't want the resistance of the threads. So you want to make sure it's torquing nice and easy. Easy. Hey, Joey, can you grab the pry bar and come hold this for me? Okay, so back here I've got a couple of bolts to counter hold it. Just hold it against the uh, engine stand. All right, 410 newton meters. You ready? Dude, that's a lot. That is a lot. Ready? Yeah. <sighs> okay. Holy. We're almost ready for the cylinder head, but there's a few things we got to do first. In the bottom of the cylinder head, or on the uh, bottom side of it, is an oil ch return check valve. And this check valve can fail. There's also an O-ring on here that can go bad. And in order to replace it, you have to remove the cylinder head from the engine. So obviously we're here. Right now is a good time to go ahead and replace it. It just uses a big flathead screwdriver. Give it a little twist. Okay, we unthread it from the uh, cylinder head. If I compare the two, the one I removed from the cylinder head, the O-ring is completely flat. And the new one, obviously it's a new O-ring, so it's a lot more round which is good. I'm glad we caught this and we're gonna be installing the new one. All right, next is the cylinder head gasket. There's actually two different thicknesses of gasket. This is the original factory gasket right here. And they make one that's 0.3 millimeters thicker, which is the same as 12 thousandths thicker. And the reason they do that is because if you remove enough material between the top of the cylinder head and the 
I'm sorry, the cylinder head and the engine block, if you remove 12 thousandths of material, that would make up the difference. However, we only remove four thousandths of material, so we don't need the thicker head gasket. We're gonna go with the factory head gasket right here. And just like how we sealed the oil pan and the timing cover with some sealants right here, we're gonna do the same thing before we put the head gasket on. All right, the cylinder head have these two dowels here, which help holds the uh, gasket in place, which is awesome. Another tip here is all the threaded holes for the head studs or for the head bolt. I went ahead and cleaned them out. I blew them out with air. You don't want any debris, you don't want any oil in there. You know, I was talking to Chris about the engine build and he actually had one request. He wanted me to install piston return springs with the highest possible spring rate. That way we can get the best performance out of it. This is 120 spring rate, which is perfect for this engine. In fact, it's going to provide the perfect piston preload while maintaining recoil tension at high RPMs. The design of these return springs are free angle design with low frequency helix that will measure only four gauge of deflection, which will provide low stress range to prevent wall factor fatigue. So these will work perfect for this engine. Let's go ahead and get them opened up and installed. Okay, now we're ready to bolt it down. Okay, it's time to torque down the cylinder head and they use one-time use bolts. They also have these washers that are also one-time use. So these are all brand new and the cylinder head have these little recessed areas for these washers to sit. So we're gonna go ahead and get the washers in all of those spots. The threaded holes are dry. However, we need to lubricate the uh, top of the washers, which is where the head of the bolt is. Before we put the bolt in, we're gonna make sure we lubricate it. A little bit of oil, and I'm just using 30 weight oil here. And I'm just repeating this process. When I mark these with the pen, I'm putting, uh, I'm drawing a line on the head of the bolt, so it's facing you know, side to side like this, after I do my first set of 90. When I do my second set of 90, I'll know that the lines are facing this way. A long time ago when I was at BMW, we didn't have, I didn't have this fancy torque wrench to tell me when 90 degrees. So what I would do is I would line my torque wrench or actually a breaker bar and I would line it perpendicular with the head this way and then 90 degrees would be this way. So I would turn it until I reached 90 degrees and that was how I knew I got to 90 degrees. We are sending the guys an engine, but without exhaust because the guys already have exhaust headers and in the event that they need to use the engine, we wanna make it as easy as possible for them to swap everything over. So we're gonna go ahead and install exhaust studs. What's difficult about installing studs like this is that they are just a threaded rod. So there's really nothing to grip onto it. And if you use vice grips, you'll just end up ruining the threads. Using a stud installer is the preferred method. However, if you don't have a stud installer, here is a little DIY hack. Start by threading the rod by hand after you clean the holes and threads. I used a thread chaser, sprayed it with brake cleaner, and then blew them out with compressed air. Thread it in until it's snug. Then install a nut, spin it on a few times, install a second nut, now tighten the outer nut into the inner nut, basically jam them together. Now we're gonna use the outside nut to drive that stud into the head until it bottoms out. You don't wanna crank on it, just stop once it bottoms out. Then we're gonna counter hold the inside nut, use a wrench on the outside to bust that nut loose. Now we just finger the nuts off and you have a stud like me. Now we're gonna rebuild the disavow. What is a disavow? Well, it controls the air that moves through the intake manifold by opening or closing this valve. When the disc of valve is closed at low RPMs, the air travels through a long single tube in the intake manifold producing velocity, creating better torque. Then at high RPMs, the valve opens, providing more air volume, giving you more horsepower. These disc of valves typically last 80 to 100,000 miles before any problems occur, and problems do occur, causing symptoms like rattling noises from the engine area, loss of power at mid or high RPMs, lack of low end torque, poor fuel economy, or even a check engine light for lean running conditions. 
The most common failure is the seal that's molded into the case. As you can see right here, it's flattened out over time and can cause a lean running condition by allowing unmetered air into the intake. This usually happens after the valve's been removed and then installed for other service work. The worst failure comes from this pivot pin right here holding the flap in place. It can loosen and fall out and make its way into the intake where you can say goodbye to your engine. Good job, BMW. We're going to address both of these issues with a rebuild kit not available from BMW because BMW will only sell you the DISA valve as a complete assembly. Before installing the repair kit, we need to check a few things first. I check to make sure that the housing is in good condition with no cracks or damage. This valve has a diaphragm inside that we need to check. I close the valve, placing my thumb over the vent hole sealing the diaphragm. Then I let go of the flap. It'll move slightly, but then hold. This indicates that the diaphragm is good. If the diaphragm was leaking, the flap would just open fully while I sealed the vent hole with my thumb. And in that case, the entire DISA valve would need replaced. Let's get started rebuilding this DISA valve by removing this cover with my pocket pry bar. That gives us access to the bell crank and the vacuum actuator. Now I remove the retaining clip and slip the actuator rod off the bell crank lever and move the actuator rod out of the way. I now use this giant screw included in the kit as a removal tool. I thread it into the plastic bell crank, then use needle nose pliers to pry it out, leveraging against the DISA housing. Now that the bell crank has been extracted, let's inspect it because this is another very common failure of these DISA valves. The hex edges you see here actually look pretty good. I've seen these get completely rounded off because, you know, plastic parts. It then creates extra clearance in the flap, causing that rattling noise that I was talking about earlier. The next step is to remove this pressed pin by wedging a screwdriver between the housing frame and the end of the flap and gently prying and twisting until you see the pin start to extract enough to get a thin pair of side cuts in there so you can pull it the rest of the way out. This little guy right here has fallen out and ruined many engines, but not on my watch, not this time. Now that the pin and ball crank lever are removed, the flap basically just falls out. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the original plastic flap assembly versus the new anodized aluminum assembly. As you can see, besides being aluminum, the major design change is the pin, where it now threads through the entire flap assembly with zero chance of it falling out. This is what BMW should have done from the start. Before assembly, we need to clean the carbon from the DISA housing, and I need to make sure nothing clogs this vacuum port. A toothpick is a good idea to shove in there while you're cleaning. I don't have a toothpick, so I'm just really careful here. Now that it's all clean, it's time to lube our crank. We only want to lube the base of the bell crank, not the tip. You'll see why in just a moment. I slide the bell crank into the DISA valve and install the actuator rod. I then clean the tip of the bell crank to make sure it's free of any grease. The tip of the bell crank is inserted into the flap and even though it's a tight machine tolerance, we use red thread locker in the female side of the flapper valve to make up any lost clearances. You don't want to use too much here because you don't want to have extra overflow into the bearing. While installing the flapper valve, pay attention to the notch in the valve in relation to the frame. Now we install the flap and with the opposite hand, slide the bell crank into the flap. The screw is installed next, but first I install lock washer and then a little thread locker. After installing the screw, I check for proper operation of the valve and for any excessive play. This flattened molded seal has to be scraped away to make room for a new O-ring. This does take some time and patience. It's very important to get all the little remnants out so the groove is as clean as possible. I then grease the new O-ring and slip it on. We now have a complete rebuilt DISA that's better than new. I'm gonna set it aside for now as I prepare the intake manifold. This engine came from a BMW E60, which is a five series. Chris fixes cars an E46, a three series. Although the two engines are the same, some of the sensors and configurations are different. Because of those differences, this harness is not going on the E46. I stripped the manifold by removing the fuel rail, then all the injectors. The crankcase ventilation hoses are next, along with the crankcase ventilation valve. The intake gaskets are coming off. We're definitely not gonna need these anymore. The crankcase distribution manifold is next. Then I remove the idle air control valve along with the rubber boot. Now let's take it over to the pressure washer. Look at this mess. I spray the manifold with some engine degreaser and after I let it soak for a little bit, I hit it with the pressure washer. Now we're gonna let the intake manifold dry and get back to cleaning some other parts. 
I'm going to start with cleaning these injector retaining clips. I use a detailing brush to scrub the dirt away, and then I use a rag to wipe them off. I know, I have a problem. I just can't install dirty parts, but look how good these turned out. Totally worth it. I repeat this process by cleaning every single part that I pulled off the intake manifold, including this bracket, the fuel hose, and the fuel rail. These parts will look brand new when I'm done with them. This is the crankcase air distribution manifold. I get rid of all the old O-rings and I clean it too. If you guys watched the series where I helped Paul from Deutsch Auto Parts and Charles, the humble mechanic, VR6 swap a 1984 Scirocco, one of our major setbacks was not one, but two faulty injectors causing us to scramble for parts and it pushed our project back another day. Well, I don't want that to happen to Chris and his team, so I got six new injectors. I now install the fuel rail, and when I look under the hood of a car, the first thing I do is look at how clean those fuel injector clips look. Ooh-wee! I install new O-rings on the crankcase vent manifold. Now, I think I've only seen these seals fail maybe once, maybe twice in my career, but, you know, while we're in there, we may as well. I install a new crankcase vent valve and the hoses. Now there's a lot of discussion with modifying the crankcase vent system, including installing a catch can. However, the factory system is actually designed really, really well, and they do last about 80,000 miles, so I decided just to leave it in stock form. Better not to mess with something that we know already works well. After installing new intake manifold gaskets, I install our rebuilt disavalve, and now we have a complete intake manifold that we'll install a little later. But for now, let's set it aside and get back to the engine. We're gonna rebuild and clean this Vanos unit. The Vanos controls the intake and exhaust timing with oil pressure. It mounts to the front of the engine and connects directly to the camshaft timing gears. As you can see, the engine oil has varnished the aluminum. No worries, I'm gonna show you an easy way to get that clean with degreaser like I have right here in this bowl. You're gonna see how great this turns out once it's all clean. This is a dirty job, so let's go ahead and get the gloves on. This is the intake side and this is the exhaust side. The exhaust side is spring loaded as you can see right here. The intake side isn't. I can move the piston back and forth with my fingers. Let's start by removing the exhaust camshaft sensor. I'm going to be replacing it with a new one once we're all done. Then I remove the five bolts from the intake cover and remove the piston. As you can see the seals are right here. Look at how loose this thing fits inside the housing showing you just how much we need to replace these seals. Next is the cover for the exhaust side. However, it's spring loaded, so I have to hold down the housing while I remove the four fasteners. We need to keep note here, the spring is cone shaped with the widest part of the spring sitting at the bottom of the housing. Here's the brown varnish I was talking about. All you do is apply some degreaser and scrub. If you let the degreaser soak, that works great too. I use this brush to agitate the degreaser and look how good that looks. I take the pistons over to the vise and I use a soft grip attachment to prevent any scoring or damage. I then use an electric impact and zip off the cap with a 24 millimeter socket. The top washer, which came off with the cap, comes off first. Then I use my 90 degree pick to remove the thrust bearing, the thick middle washer is next, and then the second thrust bearing. And then finally the spacer ring. I replace the spacer ring with the new rattle ring. The new rattle ring is made up of tighter tolerances to make up any worn parts within the piston assembly to help prevent any rattling noises that we sometimes hear with these Vanos units. And then I assemble in reverse order while lubricating the parts with oil and I do the exact same thing with the other piston. These pistons have Teflon seals that need to be cut out. I like to cut at a diagonal so I don't scratch the piston. Then I use a pick to remove the Teflon seal. Under the Teflon seal, surprise, is a rubber O-ring. I cut the same way to remove it. It's the same procedure for the top seal as it is for the bottom seal. Installing the O-rings, well, those are easy. The Teflon seals, however, are a little tricky because they don't stretch like the rubber O-rings do. I like to put the Teflon seals in a baggie, and then I put the baggie into hot water for about a minute. The hot water warms up the Teflon seals, making them more pliable. I then work the Teflon seal around the piston and into the groove. The Teflon seals need to be sized, so I lubricate the Teflon seals and the housing walls. I then put the piston into the housing and let it sit for about 60 seconds. This allows the Teflon seals to sort of compress to the correct size. I then remove the piston one more time and install the housing cover to compress the smaller seals. One last inspection reveals the seals are now properly seated, so now it's time to assemble the Vanos unit. I tighten all the fasteners to 10 newton meters. By the way, look how clean this Vanos looks. And I didn't forget, it gets a new exhaust cam sensor too. 
Now we're installing the camshafts and lifters. While the engine was at Mike's machine shop, he inspected the camshafts, the cam bridges, and the cam caps. They're all within spec, so there's no need to replace them. I'm replacing all the hydraulic lifters with brand new ones, and since they're hydraulic, there's no adjustment needed. The lifters fit into the camshaft bridges, and it's really tricky to install the camshaft bridges and lifters onto the engine without the lifters falling out. So I decided to use the engine stand to my benefit rotate the engine 90 degrees and install the cam bridges to keep the lifters from falling out. You know how the saying goes, work a little smarter, not harder. I'm gonna use these cam caps for now to hold the bridges in place. Now this would be the perfect opportunity to upgrade the camshafts to the ZHP camshafts for better performance. However, I'm gonna go ahead and stick with the stock camshafts here because the DME, AKA the ECU for their engine would need to be tuned to really see the full potential of the upgraded camshafts. Since this is a backup engine only, it can't really deviate too much from their current engine. I'm installing the camshafts in a particular orientation in preparation for setting the timing. Cylinder one cam lobes will face up and slightly towards each other. After setting the cam caps in place, the camshaft needs to be loaded evenly. So I tighten them down little by little and evenly across the entire camshaft until the camshaft caps have been fully mated. Then I do my final torque sequence. Now it's time to lock the camshafts to top dead center by rotating the camshaft with my open end wrench until the timing tool is flat onto the cylinder head surface. You see those two divots at the back of each camshaft? Those divots are only on one of the four sides and their purpose is to help set the timing. They need to be facing up just like this. Oh, and just a note here, each of these cam caps or bearing covers you might call them have a particular stamping on each one of them. And that lets me know exactly where they belong. So A is for intake, E is for exhaust, and they're labeled one through seven for each of the camshaft journals. So basically you can't mess it up. Now I'm installing the exhaust side chain sprocket onto the camshaft and the arrow on the sprocket has to face the exhaust side of the engine and it must be flush with the top of the cylinder head surface. This is a tool I'm gonna to use to preload the chain by pressing against the tensioning rail. It only gets tightened to 0.7 newton meters. It'll get replaced with a hydraulic tensioner later. I install the three threaded studs and torque them to 20 newton meters. Later, you'll see where they hold the thrust washer and the cam sensor gear. Next is the secondary timing chain guide and it's just held down with two fasteners. This is how Vanos adjusts timing by moving the spline shaft in and out, rotating the camshafts for the desired valve timing. I think this is pretty cool. Before installing the secondary timing chain, I installed this tensioner that's preloaded with the hold down pin that I will remove later. So here I use another special tool to position both chain wheels with the timing chain that ensures that they are perfectly aligned with each other. Once I get the sprockets into place, I install the intake spline shaft, then the intake thrust washer, and finally I tighten these nuts by hand for now. Also, these bolts are hand tightened right now because we need them slightly loose for our final adjustment later. After the thrust washer, cup spring, I install the cam sensor gear, and I don't fully tighten these nuts down either. Hey, guess what? Another special tool. And this one gets bolted where the Venus would normally go, and what it does is it helps keep the valve timing from moving for our final adjustment. Now I can tighten down those intake and exhaust fasteners. I remove the camshaft lockdown tool and I rotate the engine two times and position the harmonic balancer to top dead center so we can double check our timing by reinstalling the camshaft lockdown plates and check the clearance with the feeler gauge. We should have less than one millimeter of clearance between the tool and the cylinder head surface. And the feeler gauge didn't slide under, so we're good. If the clearance was more than a millimeter, then we'd have to loosen the sprocket fasteners again and readjust the timing again. Before installing the Venos gasket, I put a little RTV at the top edge of the cylinder head for a perfect seal. I slide the Venos gasket on. The next is the Venos assembly. After installing the fasteners, I torque them down, then I installed a left-handed set screws that thread into those dome-shaped spline shafts that we talked about earlier. Next are two new ceiling caps with new O-rings, then finally the ceiling covers with new aluminum crush rings. Now I can remove the timing chain tensioning tool and install the new hydraulic timing chain tensioner, and you guessed it, I torque it to spec, which is 40 newton meters. Before we go any further, we need to double check the timing by using this tool that replaces oil pressure with air pressure for the Venos. I have to hold the air hose on there because it keeps wanting to fall off. I rotate the crank two times, I set it back to top dead center, I lock the cams down and check the clearance like we did before. 
I put the feeler gauge in there and it's perfect. I'm installing Beiru Performance spark plugs and even though they come pre-gapped to 1.6 millimeter, I double check them and they look good. A little anti-seize on the threads and I start them by hand before torquing them to 25 newton meters. Guys, we're getting so close. It's time to install the valve cover with new gaskets and new grommets. The washer goes onto the nut first, then the grommets, and then we repeat it 15 more times. Now I put a little RTV on the sharp corners of the half moons on the back of the cylinder head and on the front of the Venus assembly. Some more RTV at the joining seams where the Venus meets the cylinder head. Now I carefully place the valve cover with the gasket onto the cylinder head and I tighten it down. I'm installing a new thermostat, which is integrated into this plastic housing along with a new seal. I need to install the new intake cam sensor, but the Venos solenoid is in the way. Well, what I really should have done was install the cam sensor before I installed the Venos. Oh well. This is another change I made to this engine to work with the E46. The E60 only has a single coolant pipe for the heater core. You guys saw me remove it in the first video and it had a plug that fits the hole for the second coolant pipe. I removed that plug, threw it away, and now I'm installing the second coolant pipe to fit perfectly with the E46. These NOx sensors are basically listening to the engine for irregular noises like pre-detonation and communicates that information to the engine's ECU where the ECU can then determine if it's necessary to adjust the timing to help prevent catastrophic failure. So as you can see, these guys are super important. This is an upgraded braided stainless steel Venus oil supply line. The original is prone to leaking and this one should last forever. The plastic water pump and power steering pump pulleys are both upgraded to aluminum for ultimate durability. Now we can install that beautiful intake manifold with those super clean injector retainers. Okay, this is something that really bugs me. When companies put sticky paper labels directly onto the part where you don't want a sticky mess. Come on, guys. So anyway, as I mentioned earlier, this is a different dipstick tube that works with the E46. And you can't have a race car without a billet racing dipstick, right? So now I'm going to ask my neighbor Luke, the welder, for a favor. Luke! I don't know if you've ever seen an engine get shipped before, but sometimes it's, they just throw an engine, like a used engine on a tire, and then it's just strapped down with like a ratchet strap, and it's just, it, it looks terrible. Well, I've got a really nice engine over here that I need okay. to ship out, and I want a really nice bracket to, so it's not on a tire and, and strapped down. You think you can help me with that? I think I can help you with that. Cool. All right, well, come over, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. All right, let's go. Cool, man. Thanks. Thanks to Luke for building this amazing custom engine stand and helping my dad build a box with some leftover wood we had laying around the shop. You know, dad doing dad things. Well guys, it made it in the nick of time as Chris and his team are packing up for the race. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.